Playing tunes in sets. Why do we do it or not do it? Grouping of tunes into sets or medleys is so universal in Celtic music that nobody questions it. But this is not the case in old time or bluegrass, both of which have a lot in common with Celtic music. So why are sets so important in Irish and Scottish music? What do these groupings achieve? And was it always like this? And what is it about old time and bluegrass which makes set playing so much less common? First of all, let's look at the situation in Celtic music. When you first start out playing Irish or Scottish music, you'll probably learn one or two simple individual tunes, either by ear, from a book, or at a workshop or lesson. After a while, it may occur to you that, whether in a session, at a gig, at a dance, or on a recording, traditional tunes are almost universally played in groups, sets, or medleys, each tune played two or three times before running seamlessly into the next. The selection of tunes or groups in this way is an art in itself. We will look at what is involved in choosing tunes for a set, and what it aims to achieve, but I also want to answer a very interesting question. Were tunes always played in groups like this, or is that a relatively modern invention? And if it's such a good idea, why doesn't it extend to old time and bluegrass? It's my contention that before the 20th century, tunes were in fact almost always played individually. Dancing was the main purpose of playing these tunes, and musicians would play a single tune for as long as the dance lasted. This was not because of a lack of repertoire, but simply that, as was probably the case in dance traditions throughout the world, the tune and the dance were seen as part of the same thing. The concept of dance music played purely for listening was still a rarity. By and large, it was not until the advent of the recording industry in the 1920s that there was a separation of music for dancing and music for listening. In the context of a dance, the attention of an audience is divided between the movement on the dance floor, the physical presence of the musicians, and the music itself. On record, however, all you have is the sound of the music, and repeated playing of the same 32 bars of tune would quickly lose its appeal. The 78 RPM discs which were used in the early 20s would hold around three minutes of music, more than enough time to exhaust the interest of a listener in a single tune. The studio engineers and recording executives would have had little experience or indeed interest in the original context of the music they were recording, and they would impose their own ideas of what constituted good musical practice. In the case of master Irish-American fiddler Michael Coleman, for example, this included pairing him with some abysmally inappropriate piano accompanists. The record executives would also have jumped at the chance of including two or three tunes on a single side, rather than just one, as this would not only add more musical variety, but would also attract more buyers simply on the basis of the multiple titles. The medleys or sets recorded by Coleman, such as the Tar Bolton, the Longford Collector and the Sailor's Bonnet, or the Morning Dew and the Woman of the House, were so successful and influential that even today Irish musicians anywhere in the world will be familiar with these sets, even if they have never heard the original recordings. We will probably never know for certain, but it's quite possible that these sets were cobbled together on the day of the recording and had never been played before. So is there any other evidence, either for or against the idea, that medley playing began in the 20th century? Our main source of evidence for repertoire and style of tune playing before the days of recordings is the study of the handwritten manuscripts of contemporary musicians. Take a look at the pad of any Cayley band today and you will see the tunes written out in groups. Or if a tune is on its own, there's a good chance there will be a scribbled note at the bottom suggesting what other tunes it could lead into. Surely, if tunes were played in this way in earlier times, the manuscripts would at least hint at this. I'm no expert on early tune collections, but I had a word with Andrew Kuntz, director of the encyclopedic online tune collection The Fiddler's Companion, and its successor, the Traditional Tune Archive. If you're looking for information on virtually any traditional tune, these archives will have the answer. Andrew told me... My passion has been tracing tunes in handwritten manuscripts, but I can tell you that in reviewing dozens of manuscript collections from England, Ireland, Scotland and the US, there's little evidence I've seen of set playing. If this is indeed the case, it immediately brings up further questions. Firstly, how did fiddlers get away with it? Were they more inventive and creative than today's musicians, so that they could maintain interest despite endless repetition of a tune? As Andrew explained, I can't credit that the 19th century fiddlers were more inventive than today's fiddlers, but I don't think they were as social in their music making and that there was much more solitary playing. 
There's certainly ample pictorial evidence in paintings and drawings of solo musicians playing for dancers. I suspect the demands of a dance fiddler were less in the 19th century and that audiences did not expect tunes to change, nor did they expect variation or innovation in melody. Perhaps that was appreciated by some when it happened, but I think the focus was on the dancing and not on the accompaniment. The music was simply a means to facilitate the dance, and not all that important in and of itself. I think dance audiences have grown much more sophisticated since then and more demanding of the musicians. Certainly in my own local contra dance scene in the Hudson Valley, dancers want innovative, exciting bands to dance to. Simply playing trad tunes, even skillfully, will not do. There was no recorded music in the 19th century, so there was relatively little comparison going on. I think a dance fiddle of them was probably measured by the steadiness of their rhythm and perhaps the drive of their playing, not their melodic inventiveness. I think there's a strong case that, at least in England and Ireland, set playing is indeed a recent phenomenon. However, Scotland may be a different case. I spoke to Paul Cranford of Cranford Publications, who drew my attention to the tradition of grouping strathspeys and reels as early as the late 18th century. I think the playing of dance tunes in medleys, he told me, began with Scottish fiddlers in the late 18th, early 19th century, and initially may not have extended much beyond a musically literate elite working the gentry market. The Gow family publications, for example, include some medley selections, and I can recall at least one direct reference to Gow playing, or rather attempting unsuccessfully to play, a B-flat Strathspey and real medley. If we take late 18th century Scotland as our starting point, it's easy to imagine the practice spreading to England and Ireland among musically literate professionals, perhaps accompanying the spread of Scotch reels, but it really is very hard to judge how rapidly or widely the practice did or didn't spread before the 20th century, outside Scotland at least. Cranford then makes a strong case for a much earlier use of medley playing in Scotland. However, he is referring to the special case of grouping reels and strathspeys, whereas the modern concept of set playing is much more about playing multiple tunes of the same type and tempo. There is no doubt, however, that any fiddler hearing a real Strathspey medley for the first time would have been struck by the musical drama of the transition and it would have been an attractive idea to copy. Whether it was the Scots who introduced the idea or the record companies of the early 20th century, once set playing started it quickly became a universal practice. It was well suited to many new contexts of traditional music playing. In the 1930s, for example, in Ireland, the notorious Public Dance Halls Act put an end to informal, small-scale music making, but at the same time led to the formation of many Cayley bands. These were larger, louder and more disciplined groupings than had been seen before, and they were well suited to playing predetermined medleys of tunes, with less emphasis on variation and ornamentation, and much more on strict rhythm and regular changes of tune within a single long dance. With the advent of the folk revival in the 60s and 70s, traditional music began to appear both in folk clubs and increasingly in concert halls. In this context, the separation of music for dance and music for listening was increased, and the music definitely had to stand on its own two feet. Again, set playing was invaluable in providing richness and variety. Another relatively new context was the advent of playing music in pub sessions, which, surprisingly to many, did not actually begin until the 1940s. A session is an informal grouping of traditional musicians who meet on a regular basis to play for their own enjoyment. A typical set at a session would be a grouping of three or four reels, perhaps played two or three times. These will be started and led by one person, with members of the group dipping in or out, depending on whether or not they knew each tune. A session where all the tunes were played singly will be an odd session indeed, and most of the flow and excitement would be missing. So what makes a good set? Some specific tune groupings, as we've already seen, were established simply because so many people had heard and learned from a few famous recordings. It soon became obvious that the selection of sets should not be just a random affair, but with careful thought each change of tune could add its own change of colour or spark of excitement. A change of key or mode is often a good idea. Major to minor or minor to major works well. Usually only one sharp or flat is added at a time, so that the keys are closely related. A classic sequence would be G to D major to A minor, or another would be E minor to D major to A major. The phrasing of tunes can be an important factor, as can the notes at the very end of the tune leading into the next one. Some links are very neat, while others will often sound clumsy. If drama and surprise is what you're looking for, a change such as A major to B flat major will bring the house down. For some people, the linking of tunes is not just an art, but also a competitive sport. 
Andrew Kuntz drew my attention to the Canadian practice of competitive set playing, also known as fiddle elimination or pure lane. A group of fiddlers sit in a circle and one starts off with a reel. At the end of a single playing, the person to their right takes over with a new reel without breaking the beat, pausing or repeating what has been played before. Anyone who makes a mistake is eliminated and the set goes round and round the circle until only two are left. At this point, the final two play just a single A section each, greatly heightening the excitement. April Virch can be seen on several YouTube clips competing, and she told me that to win requires not only a huge repertoire, but also a cool head and the ability to think very quickly. So are we to regard the playing of sets as a great step forward in the practice of traditional music, a natural evolutionary leap? Certainly not everyone thinks so. For some people, both players and listeners, there should be sufficient beauty, individuality and interest in a single tune and that to package them together merely cheapens them. For a top class player, subtle variation, either spontaneous or prepared, should make it possible to play a tune round many times without any loss of interest. The very first country fiddle recording was by Texan cowboy fiddler Ick Robertson in 1922 and one of his opening numbers was the old-time classic Sally Goodin which he played no less than 12 times, each one a perfectly executed variation in the Texas contest style of which he was a master. The tune however was not a hit and the record companies quickly realised that in country music at least instrumental virtuosity was not a guarantee of commercial success. An example from much closer to today would be Irish fiddler Martin Hayes, who has always pursued an individual and thoughtful approach to tune playing. He is known for deliberately slowing reels to well below dance tempo in order to fully explore the fine detail of individual notes and phrases. On his 2008 album, Welcome Here Again, he deliberately chose to record most of the tunes individually with only a few sets. The results are magical. On the sleeve notes he comments, There are as many ways to play Irish music as there are people to play it. One of its greatest strengths is in its flexibility of interpretation. Everyone has the opportunity to put their personal stamp on it. Another long-time champion of exploration and variation is accordionist John Kirkpatrick, for whom this is a hot topic. Some years ago I interviewed him for my Exploring Folk Fiddle book, and he was adamant that not only was the playing of single tunes the norm from the 17th to the 19th century, but that folk music has lost a great deal since the idea disappeared. He told me... When I started playing for dancing, I worked out medleys of tunes for each dance, like most other people were doing, but I found I got so engrossed in exploring the possibilities of the first tune that I never got round to any of the others. I think it's also extremely interesting and pertinent to point out that for some hundreds of years everybody was united in the idea that each dance had just one tune and the musicians would play continuously for as long as necessary. So how does this compare to the situation in America? Certainly, in the Celtic traditions of places like Cape Breton, the playing of sets has been very much adopted, as it has on the contradance scene. Contradance, of course, is very much oriented towards dance. Within this context, there's a lot to be said for grouping tunes together. In this noisy setting, the subtlety of variation or ornamentation, which can add so much to a solo concert performance, would be wasted. The lift and drive achieved through changes of key or groove, however, are very much appreciated by those on the dance floor. In old-time music, the most common context for playing is the picking or jam session, where musicians sit around in an informal circle and play together. In this context, sets of tunes are rare. One reason for this is that old-time musicians love to get stuck into a single tune for a long time, going round and round, ten or even twenty times. With its shuffles and syncopation, old-time is much more groove-orientated and less focused on melody and variation. Craig Edwards summed it up nicely like this. In old time, we like to revel in the joy and mastery and excitement and rhythmic groove of each tune, not by improvising or even varying much, but by getting closer to its essence and fullness in each successive rendition. And one tune may be played for eight or ten minutes, and occasionally longer when the session is getting hot. This also allows players who didn't know the tune when someone else started it to learn, absorb and master its nuances, so that the group as a whole tightens and shares the musical conversations that develop. Duck Baker, as part of the same conversation, added, There's something very addictive about reaching a tight groove where the music becomes a larger thing with its own compelling forward momentum that just doesn't want to stop. In that respect, it's a drug or some kind of magic conversation between the players. The spell can get broken by changing tunes. He also pointed out that the picking session, as currently practised, is a modern revivalist invention. In previous centuries, this music would almost always have been played for dancing rather than purely for the enjoyment of the players. 
there's little evidence either way as to whether a solo fiddler, or perhaps a fiddle and banjo duo, while playing for dancing, would have changed tunes within a dance. It seems likely they would have had more than enough on their plate playing unamplified, and possibly also calling the steps, without having to worry about tune changing. Another important factor with today's old-time jam sessions is that fiddles and banjos are often tuned to a particular key. This means firstly that one tune will very often be followed by another in the same key for quite a long time, and also that instant key change, often one of the chief goals of set playing, becomes impossible. Without key changes, I'm pretty sure that the set playing in Celtic music would rapidly die out. Not all old-time music is played at jam sessions. In a concert, it would be a brave musician indeed who would play 20 times around the same tune, no matter how compulsive the groove, and there is more likelihood of tunes to be grouped together. Some old-time tunes are a natural match, such as Bonaparte's Retreat and Midnight on the Water, and these are frequently played together. And what about the early recording industry? Some of the very earliest recordings did indeed group tunes together. For example, Eck Robertson's pairing of Sally Johnson with Billy in the Low Ground, complete with key change. However, this idea, so popular on the Irish recordings, didn't seem to catch on, perhaps because country music recordings soon realised that songs with instrumental breaks were far more commercial than pure instrumentals. Virtually all the Skillet Lickers recordings, for example, seem to be single titles. Yet another context for old-time music was, and still is, the fiddle contest. Here there is certainly a focus on listening rather than dancing or jamming, and great attention to detail on the performance, but the conventions and rules of contests are very much focused towards individual tunes rather than medleys. The situation with bluegrass is different again. The repertoire is more focused on songs than instrumentals, and it would often make little sense to group different songs together. More importantly, bluegrass has a strong focus on individual improvisation and soloing. Typically, most of the musicians playing will want to take a one-verse solo. With a five-piece band, this is plenty enough to stretch a song out for a good length. In a picking session, there may be 20 or more potential soloists, and even once around the circle is more than enough to make the idea of a medley totally unnecessary. There is an element of discipline, organisation and restraint about bluegrass, which is essential to the functioning of the music, and which, at least in this context, is quite absent in Celtic music. The performance of a typical bluegrass song is full of variety in terms of arrangement, texture and the balance of instrumentation, so that the need for a medley or a set of tunes is quite unnecessary. So to conclude, it seems likely that prior to the early 20th century, across all the traditions we have discussed, single tunes for a single dance were usually the rule. In the case of Irish music, this changed as a result of the very influential recordings made by people such as Michael Coleman, who, under pressure from the record companies, started playing in sets. Subsequent generations have fully adopted this practice, and the thoughtful grouping of tunes has become an important feature throughout Celtic music, whether for dancing, performing or at sessions. In old time music, by contrast, sets are much less common, with endless repetition of a single tune seen as not just acceptable but desirable, while in bluegrass the emphasis on concert performance and on individual improvisation means that sets have never caught on, and probably never will. Thank you.